European people who are all watching, you're standing with a group of people on the dike of mainland Netherlands overlooking the Wadden Sea. And it's a gray day. It's not yet drizzling, but it could start anytime. And you're looking over water or was it mud? Or well, actually it is mud and that turns gray as well. So there you are, you're a guide, a Wadden Sea guide, explaining the wonders of this great world heritage to maybe people who have seen other wonders of nature like the Great Barrier Reef or the Amazon or the Grand Canyon. And that's also world heritage. And it's all terrific colors and waterfalls that reach the, the sky and rocks of a zillion years old. But there's no doubt about wonders like that. So what makes this gray area so unique? And that needs a lot of explanation. During this presentation, I'm going to be your guide on the virtual mud flats of the one sea in the Netherlands. So we're going to go on a dry excursion. But let's introduce myself first. My name is Renate de Bakkeren, and I live partly in Scheveningen and partly in Harlingen, which is in the north of the Netherlands. And my life consists of mud, mountains, sea, salt and rowing and everything outdoors. What I do is I work for an organization called the Waddenvereniging, and that's a nature conservation area working on the conservation of this great world heritage Wadden Sea area. And uh, we started work in 1965 and we're still needed. So that's not a real good thing. What I do is um, I coordinate the public activities and the excursion program. And I'm also a trainer uh, for entrepreneurs and the World Heritage Guide. So what I do is the guides that work for us, I see to it that they tell the right story about the outstanding universal value of this World Heritage One C. And also entrepreneurs, we love to work with entrepreneurs in the area as they meet the guests and the visitors and the tourists. And the tourists start seeing things when they know things. And that's why we sort of train the trainer program. Uh, Anyway, we go back where we started. This looks a lot better, doesn't it? When you're there on a ship, on a mud flat, when it's low tide, and then you start hearing the, uh, the nice specific sounds of the wooden sea and some birds in the background. It's beautiful soft light. And when you're there, then really something starts to happen. And the thing is, you have to know the landscape to be able to cherish it and then love the real beauty of it. And we encourage people to come with us because we know things that they don't in a way. And we love to share the wonders of this world heritage, uh, Wadensee. And when you're talking Wadensee, you're explaining the world heritage. Because as I said, the more you know, the more you see. And that applies to many things and very much so for the mudflats. And um, the beauty and the wonders of the Wadden Sea are not always really visible because they're hidden in the mud. And that's why, as I said, it needs explanation. Well, there we are. It is a really special place. Actually, I all invite you to come there. It is allocated World Heritage because UNESCO and confirmed that all the wonders of the Wadden Sea meet the three criteria that uh, out of four actually that UNESCO uses. And if you look at the criteria, it makes it a lot easier to explain the true wonders of this great area. The Wadden Sea consists of, well, it's in three countries. It's the Netherlands, Germany, and Denmark, obviously. And you see, this is a very special picture. It's taken, uh, it's not one picture actually, uh, because it consists of a lot of pictures. Every, it's, it's low tide everywhere. And normally between Den Helder, where it starts in the Southwest to Esbjerg in the North, it can't be low tide at the same time because there's a time difference of about five hours. 
but now you can really see the the mud flats and all the tidal the tidal creeks etc and i really 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 love this this is the part of the netherlands where we work and what we cherish and what we try to conserve as much as possible But why is it World Heritage? As I said, UNESCO uses 10 criteria to allocate areas for as, a, as World Heritage. And actually uh, four out of those 10 uh, are for the nature World Heritage sites. And the first and most important one is it's a really original, unique landscape. And that means that the way the Wodensi existed and came into being, the, the dynamics and the natural forces that uh, caused that, you can, they're still visible up to this day. And the thing is, if you're standing on a dike overlooking it, the next day or the next week, it could be different because it, it's always moving. And I think that's a really special thing. It, you, you get never bored actually. So the geomorphological processes, you can still see them. And then we come easily to the second criteria, which is it's the adaptation to uh, this very, very dynamic area. Because you can imagine um, it's dry and it's wet because we have low and high tide and everything in between. It could be fresh water, salt water, and also very cold or very warm. It's quite shallow, so it warms up really quickly. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, extremes and you really have to cope well as an animal or a plant to survive there. Well, the adaptation to all these dynamics, they're, they're so specific and so special. Um, so the plants and the animals that adjusted to this real dynamic area, they've done that so well there's a lot of them. And that's the third criteria, the biodiversity. There's a lot of really nice, special, adjust plants and animals in the area. And most of them you can hardly see because there's one, two cells, but they are the basis of this whole ecosystem. And that's a real special area. But we have to have a closer look at this area and especially what are the reasons that people come to visit here? And we meet thousands and thousands of tourists each year on the mudflats. Well, it's easy in a way, because people enjoy nature and landscape. That's what people say. There's been a lot of uh, surveys done over the last couple of years. And as the previous uh, uh, presentation mentioned, Mikael, you also said we have different tourists that's what we've seen over the last two years as well but still people say well i'm enjoying na nature outdoors if you talk wooden sea people tend to think about the islands there's five islands you can visit and they're really crowded but it's a special feeling on an island i think many people recognize that of course, there's the sun and the beach, and it's completely different than uh, when you're living in a, in a crowded city because you're out of your normal daily life. Fortunately, people love experiencing nature in an active way. That means um, uh, going on an excursion, and that's mainly seal or bird watching. And there's a few people that say, I'm here because I love the Wadden Sea. And that's about the sea, it's not about an island, because the islands are not world heritage. Well, there's been surveys, as I said, we asked a lot of people and tourists uh, about their motivations and um, reasons, and their conduct on the island. And we've seen that a lot of people, well mainly, they uh, book an excursion, whatever excursion, on walking, cycling, or on a boat, or on a kayak, or whatever. Um, we also see that main, uh, the most people have had a higher education because well, what you see is that it's not really cheap 
to go on an island, uh, to visit an island for a week or two. Um, you know, the chalets and houses, even camping can be pretty expensive. And to be honest, which is a bit shameful, is that it's sometimes cheaper to visit Turkey in an all-inclusive holiday for a week with your whole family <laughs> than going to, to one of these islands. I think that's what you see in the results as well. And higher education mostly means more to spend. A lot of people come more often and the more often they come, the longer they stay on the island. There's a lot of people that are huge fans on, uh, from the one of the Wadden Sea and especially one of the islands, there's people that love Tessel, that only go there or love Schiermonnikoog. Well, sorry for the names, but that's what you see. There's a lot of fans. And the longer they stay, the more often they will do some of the excursions that are provided there. Um, seal watching, sometimes, sometimes bird, but fortunately, uh, people love mud walking because that is really special. You're walking on the bottom of the sea. And for a lot of people, that's kind of strange, but it is possible. And as soon as they're used to it, they love it. They don't, they don't want to get wet or muddy, but it's only the first 10 minutes. And after a while, they just dive into the mud. And then you really see something happening. And that's, that's, that's just great. Um, we also asked, uh, with who are you here? Um, it's mainly with friends and family. Uh, there's quite a few families that take their main summer holiday on one of the, these islands. And of course, especially last two years due to Corona or COVID. Of course, the price is important as the time spent. Most people think about 20 euros is a really nice price for an excursion. And it shouldn't take much longer than like three, four hours because they want to do other stuff on the island to go to, to a museum if there's one or on a walk or on the beach or whatever, or just read a book on your uh, camping or in your chalet that you've rented. So that's about what we see happening uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the tourism. Um, as I said, there's different tourists coming and they don't really care about nature. There's a lot of rubbish found. They expect more uh, service and that's not going to happen on the islands. It's, it, I'm not saying it's basic, but you need to provide for your own uh, food. Uh, it, you go to a supermarket yourself or a restaurant. It's not all inclusive. So. Um, that's a bit of a difference that we see. And um, yeah, we tend to feel the need to educate a bit more uh, when you look at that target group. But we'll see what's happening in the next year in the COVID times. Let's move on. Um, what is, what's important for us, and as we are conducting excursions ourselves, is that um, well, that's, that's the term place attachment. And the more you know about birds and seals and everything that grows and, and uh, lives there, the more you tend to have some place attachment and you tend to sort of care about it more. And if people participate in excursions, especially in ours, because we uh, focus really on the outstanding universal value of world heritage, uh, her uh, the, the three criteria, that's what we focus on, because you can tell the story of the Warden Sea completely by focusing on the criteria. Everything's in there. Um, what makes the uh, Wadden Sea area so interesting and difficult sometimes is that there's about 90 organizations and companies that organize excursions or various trips. And not everybody says the right stuff about world heritage um, if they've heard about the state of world heritage at all, because there's still people and uh, organizations that don't really know or maybe they've heard about it and they say, oh yeah, World Heritage, it's because 
you can see the horizon or it's clean air or something like that but that's not the case I'm, I'm happy that they mentioned it because it is special as well but what the outstanding universal value is hmm, there's some uh, extra uh, knowledge uh, needed what we do what we do ourselves with our organization is smaller groups we don't want the bigger the bigger stuff and you see some of our guides, we see to them that they get a lot of training. Every year they get new trainings. We encourage people to come with us and all our guides are really, really special. And of course we had to postpone our activities during COVID times. Uh, last year, we didn't do anything at all because we wanted to be careful because you can imagine that a nature conservation area that's conducting excursions in COVID times and somebody gets infected, then that's not really good promotion for us. Uh, we're an easy target for people that like bashing <laughs> nature conservation organizations. Um, so we were quiet, we didn't do anything, but and quite a few organizations decided to do tours, flat crossings to islands and some exploring trips anyway. But we didn't do it. We just watched and contemplated and thought about it. And we postponed our activities once again and decided not to do it last year. Um, because rules, they, they changed and they, will, they were multi-interpretable. So what to do? We didn't take any risk. And we're still happy that we've done that. This is what we don't want many years people, crowds, and this is what we want. And this is what we do, small groups. And that's what you need to do when you're talking COVID, of course. Um, as I said, we started again this year, but of course we had to take into consideration the new rules of uh, during the COVID times. And we decided to, uh, to ask our guides, like, hey, what's, yeah, what, what would, would be your idea to uh, conduct excursions in the, in the way that people feel safe? And of course, it's it, actually, it's quite simple. And um, yeah, everybody could think of, of this, but it's good to have some rules for yourselves. Of course, the disinfectation, that, that's, that's very obvious. And if you're with a group and you start, before you, you start the excursions, you have to explain clearly how you work on the mud flat. And you point at one of our, the guides, that's the Corona chief or COVID chief for, for that matter. And he or she is, is watching all the time. And uh, so that the guides, that conduct the excursion can do that, that piece. Surely you work in smaller groups. A family is a bubble, a pair, a couple is a bubble, and sometimes people go by themselves. They are in their uh, one person bubble. And when you try to explain something, of stand in a U shape, downwind, and if you have, oh, I forgot some, uh, <laughs> something to write. If you have, as a guide, something really special to show, which of course can happen in really nice crap or worm or whatever you walk along the bubbles with your outstretched hands or put it maybe in one of these smaller nets so you keep your distance and what also helps a lot and we uh, encourage that is uh, let people explore more themselves uh, encourage them to start digging themselves for some shellfish, the worms, the crabs and everything you can find on the mudflats because there is a true wonder of the uh, World Heritage Wadden Sea anyway. We didn't want to act as policemen, but we had to take into account the one meter and a half distance. So we just shouted porpoise, which is bruinvis in the Netherlands. That's about a meter and a half. So it's sort of sympathetic if you say, hey, poor boys, and then people say, okay, okay, yeah, we have to keep distance. We try to make fun of it. Of course, it's a serious thing, but you don't want to be a policeman all the time. So that's, um, that's how we worked. And I must say it really helped. 
And uh, the confrontating thing was in the beginning, um, we went on the mud flat in June uh, with 10 of our guides. And it all went well because you can keep distance when walking along a mud flat. But as soon as somebody of us shouted like, oh, what? Look at this. I found something really, really nice. Then you really have the, the then you tend to just go as bees on a honeypot. And then we had to had to shout to the guides ourselves. Hey, watch out, uh, porpoise. We have to keep distance. But that's what, what was necessary. The World Heritage Excursion Program that we conduct is important for a nature conservation air, uh, organization like us, because we still have to show people that there is no fence around the Wadden Sea. Um, maybe in the old days during the 70s, 80s, there were a lot more activities going on and um, there were like fishermen and other industries that said, oh, we can't do anything there in the Wadden Sea because you don't allow us to. But that's not the case. There is no fence around the Wadden, the Wadden Sea. We uh, encourage people to, to actually really enjoy the outstanding universal value of the Wadden Sea anyway, because then you start seeing things. And we love, we love the silence. And as I mentioned uh, at the start of my presentation, we work with local entrepreneurs in every excursion because we believe in the local and regional uh, businesses. It's a, um, quite a remote, yeah, for Dutch uh, standards uh, area. So everybody's happy with a few tourists. All our guides are qualified, very much so. Every year we have extra training and we learn things. We work with the best materials. We focus on a dark sky and we focus on various target groups and we do that if if you look at our vision and mission we do strive for uh, for conservation recovering good governance of nature and landscape of this great great area and that's not all we also take people on the mud flats we want to show that we need no fans that everybody can enjoy this unique area and let them get acquainted with these natural values. Because we're all part of one system anyway. And we do believe in our approach. All our guides are very passionate. They tell stories, they capture the attention of all kinds of target groups. And we do it with love and with passion. And we do it in the complete Wadden Sea area. We work in winter times, we work early in the morning, at night, we do it in a kayak, and we even do it in a bikini. And we believe it. We believe in what we do because the Wadden Sea really needs to be protected and well managed. And we try to touch people and let them open their eyes because the more you know, the more you see, and only then you start realizing how vulnerable the area is. And it's not my words now, but I read it in a book from Robert McFarlane, and he said, there's only one letter difference between wondering and wondering, and then your eyes start to open because you only protect the places that you care about. And that starts with passion. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. That's wonderful. And I'm a, <clears throat> a big fan of Robert McFarlane. He's a tremendous ah, writer. Cool. Yeah, I'm a really big fan as well. <laughs> yeah, and I hope he's translated into lots of other languages because he's a wonderful writer. Um, I, uh, we have a, a number of comments uh, here, but can I just maybe ask one question? You, you do these sure. wonderful tours for small groups, uh, but that's, that must be just a very small uh, percentage of the number of people who visit uh, Wadden Zee. Um, and you probably want to get some messages to those other people uh, about maybe 
you know, um, uh, respecting the area and behaving in a certain way or whatever. What, what, what do you do to maybe get some of those messages over? Um, well, we work in various ways. Um, last weekend, like a week ago, um, we were with about 120 people on the island of Teschelling in various smaller groups, uh, cleaning the beaches. Uh, so getting all the rubbish out, you know, the plastic rubbish, mainly plastic rubbish. And if you, well, that, that's already 120. Uh, of course, it's still not a lot, but what, what you see happening, because we, we've done these cleanup events before, is that people take home that message. And I know from about all individuals that have joined uh, events like that, is that uh, no beach walk is the same after that. They all take a bag with them to get the rubbish, to put the rubbish in. And they talk about it to their colleagues, to their families. Um, well, that's a sort of, uh, yeah, that's the way things work. And of course, we promote events like that. We uh, make movies about it. So um, the message spreads uh, via social media and, and uh, through our magazine, etc. So that's also a way to work. Of course, we like to have people there in the area. Yeah. But we also know that, um, yeah, it promotes itself and um, then, then their neighbors or family come to visit next year. Great, okay. Uh, we have a, thank you. We have a, a question from Nigel. Uh, do all local businesses understand your approach? That's local businesses. Do they understand your approach? Or would some prefer there to be more visitors? Uh, well, um... It's an interesting question because we've done a questionnaire around uh, the entrepreneurs and uh, had about 100 talks with them. Um, and we started to set up excursion with a few entrepreneurs. And a year later, uh, other entrepreneurs uh, started uh, phoning us like, hey, uh, I see my neighbor doing this. I want to work with you as well, which is good because some people don't like nature con conservation organizations. Um, we do work with uh, the Wadden um, marketing organization and they focus on the sort of dark green tourist. Uh, so not the, the Corendon or the <laughs> all-inclusive tourist. Um, we, we welcome a lot of tourists and there's, there's a limit to it because when the islands are like all occupied, then th there's no place. So it it regulates itself in a way and entrepreneurs don't always want to have more and more and more because when it's too crowded people stop coming because they go there for the silence and the quietness i hope it it um it, it answers a bit of your question yes yes that's fine there, there's one comment I, I wonder if you would mind uh, stop sharing your screen uh, okay. so we can see everybody <laughs> Lovely as your picture is. There we are. Um, we have another comment about, um, you know, sometimes a, a, an area of mud doesn't, doesn't appeal to many people. <laughs> you know, it's somewhere that you might get stuck or it's just muddy. Um, but you're saying that uh, visitors, uh, after you have met them and done your tour, they see things in different ways. And so, uh, maybe they become more carers as a result of that better understanding of, again, following yeah. Mark Farlan approach. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you see happening. Uh, people start seeing things that they've never seen before, because when do you walk on a mud flat? Uh, there's a lot of people that have never done that. But also last year, when we weren't active on the mud flats, other organizations were, and they've never been so busy. But I think you couldn't do that because you have, sometimes you have to pull people out of the mud and then you touch people and you couldn't touch other people. So it was a bit tricky. Yeah. But yeah, you sure see more. To know, the more you know, the more you see. And people start appreciating the mud. Not, yeah. not everybody, I have to admit. Some people still think oh, well, it's, it's a bit too, uh, too dirty for, me, for my likings. But most people really love it. 
Yes, and you get a maybe just a different type of meaning from it in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you, uh, Renata. That's wonderful information and a wonderful presentation.